Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ethel. I'm here with my good friend Joshua. Uh, we are here representing Art for the People. Uh, art for the People is an organization that does uh, expressly political art with a, a, a working class character. You know, we talk about art, we make art, uh, and, you know, uh, ha that art has an ex uh, expressly working class value. So today we're very excited to be talking about a movie called Sorry to Bother Sorry You. Sorry to Bother You yeah. by Boots Riley. It came out in 2018. If you have not watched it, I heavily advise you check it out because it's pretty good. We have lots of positive things to say about it. You know, we don't always have positive things to say about a lot of bourgeois art and bourgeois society. But we happen to think that Sorry to Bother You has quite a lot to say. Yeah, yeah. And um, although it might have its flaws, although it might be very well confused in some of its aspects and some of its some of its theory and some of its analysis, we think it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry to Bother You, uh, I see, like, as an, a pretty interesting film, um, primarily because, like, it does have a lot of really good, very progressive elements um and, and it's definitely confused as as Josh uh had gone into uh it does have some more backwards elements and we'll definitely be getting into that more as we go along with the show but like the 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 reason why we wanted to talk about sorry to bother you was cuz you know we had felt like we spent a lot of time on this show uh you know doing a lot of like very, very hard, scathing critiques of like bourgeois art. You know, we've talked a lot about bourgeois art uh, on our like previous, um, you know, segments. And something we wanted to do was like show uh, what like, what does, you know, proletarian art look like, you know, in practice? Like how, like what's a good example of proletarian art? And that's a kind of difficult, thing to to come up with uh, in in you know in our society and in, in bourgeois capitalist society you know there's not going to be a lot of art that like represents the working class that gets like big and popular um but like there are uh definitely like some pieces that do make it through you know uh sorry to bother you i think is like a pretty good example of like a very progressive piece with a, a predominantly working class character that like did make it through and did become very popular um, back in 2018. Uh, so that was like sort of, you know, our inspiration behind why we wanted to start talking about it. Yes, um, for disclosure, I hadn't seen Sorry to Bother You until last week, in fact. So as I said before, if you guys haven't watched it, give it a watch. Um, we happen to think it's really good. I didn't know who Boots Riley was um, up until a week ago. I had only known him from like a verse I heard from like Run the Jewels 3. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, since then I hadn't really known much about um, Boots. I didn't know that he was a, somebody with like a full um, discography of like lots of albums um, with a lot of like class conscious proletarian lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, very rare to find in the hip hop game, especially now. Um, but shout out to Boots Riley. Yeah, yeah, that big shout out to Boots Riley. And, you know, just, you know, um, without even getting into some of the um, denser political lines espoused in the movie, it's a fun movie. You know, it's a movie with, a, you know, with a fun sense of humor. It has a, um, I believe Boots himself described it as a movie with magical realism, um, an absurdist dark comedy, which it most certainly is. Yeah, yeah. Um, the movie's funny. The movie's funny. Um, it has a very likable cast of very great actors um, playing like very um, flawed and three-dimensional characters. And so even beyond, every even beyond everything, it's just a good watch. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's funny, it's technically skilled, uh, it's, it's fairly well written, you know. Um, like, all in all, I, I think it's like a really solid movie and it's a movie that I really enjoy watching. I've seen it a few times since it came out in 2018. Um, you know, I watched it again in preparation for this, uh, and like every time I've seen it, I've really enjoyed you know what I watched. It like um, it, it it does have a lot of staying power, and I think that's because of lot of of like the general truths that it has uh, in its like you know message. Um, 
Which so if you haven't watched, um, sorry to bother you. Um, basically, the plot is that there's a guy. Oh, was... for for the record, we are going to be spoiling the entire movie. So mm -hmm. um, just to get that out of the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're we're gonna be in in order to you know assess the movie, we're gonna be definitely <laughs> spoiling it. So yeah, uh, heads um, up, heads up. So um, over the course of the movie, so the movie starts with a guy named Cassius. And Cassius, Cassius is, Green, Cassius Green, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, very um, on the nose name. Right. And he's a guy from Oakland living with his girlfriend in like an apartment building. His landlord, like his uncle or something. It's a house. It's a house. Oh, yeah. He's ri he's house. living in the garage of his uncle's house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's living in the garage of his uncle's house. And so he's like, oh, I need to get me a telemarketing job because rent has been due for like the past four weeks. And I'm about to get evicted because my uncle, who's my landlord, is also broke. All right. Um, and so he decides to get a telemarketing job. And from there, he meets a series of, um, of fun and colorful side characters, as they say in the trailer, who are also union organizers. And they're trying to organize for better working conditions. So there is a, there is a growing labor front within his workplace. And so... This is coupled with the fact that it's rumored that really successful telemarketers are able to become, what do they call it in the movie? Power callers. Power callers. The movie does not immediately reveal what a power caller is, but they have like their own elevator and shit. It's, it's crazy, right? Um, this yeah, is they, obviously- Yeah, they, they're very special. Very special. And so over the film, um, Cassius learns to adopt what is called in the film a white voice. Now, the film goes out of its way to say that his white voice, which completely is actually shareable voice played by a different actor. Um, the movie's very, very like absurdist in that way. Um, but it's noted that the white voice does not actually reflect like being a white person, but instead reflects um, a very different class position. The class position, what, a petty bourgeois class position? I, I would even go as far to say as like a bourgeois class position because the petty bourgeois definitely does have like anxieties, you know? Mm -hmm. Like the whole point of the white voice is not to sound white in and of itself. The, whole, the point of the white voice is to sound unbothered. Like there isn't anything that could possibly affect you in the world, that you have everything possibly together. I think the quote in the movie is like, nah, it's not supposed to sound all nasal. It's like you, supposed like, to mean your bills are paid. You, your bills are paid. You know your girl is happy. Like you're about to leave this job and hop in the uh, hop in your Ferrari and drive out of here. I, like I'm paraphrasing, but I'm pretty sure like that's like qu close to the original quote in the show mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the movie. Um, so like it, it's very clearly supposed to represent like a bourgeois, unbothered class position, um, yes. and like. They use that as like an in to, you know, to sell people like nothing, you know, like uh, encyclopedia textbooks, you know, commodities that like nobody really needs, you know, general telemarketer stuff. Uh, and this is happening over the course of a growing union struggle, which is interrupted by Cassius himself being so successful at his job at mastering this so-called white he's voice. He's very good at the white voice. He's very good at the white voice, right? Um, from there, that's when he becomes a power caller. And power callers do not sell just mere useless commodities. They sell their weapons manufacturers. Yeah, slave they sell, labor. They sell slave labor. Mm -hmm. And this is a point where we have to mention the um, company Worry Free, which is um, a principal antagonist within the film, mm -hmm. right? Worry Free is a company that um, allows employees to be hired and employed for life. However, the way the movie frames it, the way the movie frames the nature of the relationships, um, of the productive relationships at Worry Free, it becomes clear that it's essentially slave labor. The movie opens up within the first 20 minutes um, with there being, what, a protest in front of Worry Free headquarters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the movie's already taking place on the, in the backdrop of a class struggle, not just within the workplace of, um, what is the workplace called again? Uh, um, is it Rearview? Regal View. Regal, Regal View. View, yeah. Regal View is the name of the telemarketing company. 
And so Regal, Regal View is also a subsidiary of Worry Free. Worry Free is supposed to represent like your general monopoly capitalist firm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, just like big money coming in, eating everything up. Right. Yeah. And so the movie already opens up in the backdrop of a vicious class struggle. And this puts Catches in a very perplex, very interesting situation and in that now his class loyalties are called into question. Does he unite with his Regal View? Does he unite with the Regal View workers to struggle for better conditions? Or does he become a power caller and actively contributing to the rampant exploitation of the world by capital for the sake of his own advancement of his class position? Exactly. Like, it, does he, you know, become a traitor to his friends and co-workers or, like join them in their struggle to improve their conditions. And for the first, well, for really for most of the movie, Cassius chooses the former. You know, he fully embraces being a power caller once he realizes how ridiculous the pay is. He's able to move out of his uncle's house and afford like a nice condo um, or wherever he is with his um, with his girlfriend who breaks up with him due to his changing class position and his changing interests um, as a result of that. So all of this coincides through the movie of Cassius spiraling into what essentially feels like deprecation by his um, fellow co-workers mm-hmm. um, being a power caller and him willing to put up with it for the sake of his advancing class position at the expense of his deteriorating relationships with his then ex-girlfriend and many of his um, co-workers who eventually recognized him as a traitor and a mm-hmm. snake. Keep in mind, a lot of his coworkers are his like old friends, you know, in the in the same way that like, oh, your friend gets a job, and then your friend like, oh, I got this job. They're looking for people, so now all your friends have jobs at the same place, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, like it, it's a very familiar type of situation, where it's like you're looking for a, a job, your buddy's looking for a job, your buddy's buddy is looking for a job. You know, one of you gets jobs, you all kind of get jobs, like just from you know. Uh, like what whatever means you can like Cassius lies on his uh application for like what did, uh, like w- Cassius he put that he um he used the same like lies that his own friend used to yeah, get hired yeah. at a telemarketing <laughs> company to begin with so this was you know this was not planned at all. This mm-hmm. is ironically one of the greatest flaws of the movie, like the lack of planning. It tells us this in the first five minutes mm-hmm. that Cash didn't plan shit. He yeah. just walked up in there um, without a plan, using like the same like tired lies that his his manager already heard his friend give to get that position. Um, so, the movie um, follows Cassius throughout um, throughout his journey up until he finds out a dirty secret about Worry Free. Um, he gets invited to this big bourgeois party. Um, he's doing such a good job as a power caller. He's making so much money for Worry Free uh, that they invite him to one of these, like, you know, very big, very decadent parties that the bourgeoisie rec- regularly throws. Um, it's, it's here where he meets the um, CEO of Worry Free. Um, and his whole night changes where... Um, all you know, the people attending the party assume that because he's black and interesting, they assume he knows how to rap. <laughs> so they basically force him to bust out a freestyle for like a good what, like ten minutes of the movie. Yeah, yeah. They uh, like they bully him into it. That at one point they all just start chanting, "No, I know you rap, rap, yeah, rap." And, <laughs> and he really didn't know what to do at first. And then with the beat, he just started saying, like, oh, nigga shit, nigga shit, like, 40 times. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was jump. I was jumping at that point, too. <laughs> so, you know, it was, you know what I'm saying? Um, that happened. And then it, out of the humiliation, like, the only other black guy that works at that firm had to tell him, like, hey, man, um, you know, you, you might not have your pride, but it's okay. You know what I mean? Just go talk to the big boss man because he wants to talk to you. I think the direct quote of it was, we don't cry about what should be. We just thrive in what is. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, um, so he goes to talk with the um, CEO of Worry Free. Um, CEO of Worry Free is like a super chill dude for the most part. Like, you know, he's he's very much into like drugs and rock and roll. He he loves cocaine. He loves cocaine. So it might be his favorite thing. He gives Cassius some cocaine, Mm -hmm. you know, and and Cassius gets some cocaine. Some real Peruvian shit. Some real, as he says in the movie. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And then. 
I was at that point where he lets him in on the dark secret. He wants Cassius to be a representative of a new form of worry-free worker, and that is a worker that's been genetically mutated to be half human, half horse, a literal workhorse of a human being, to increase productivity at worry-free and to secure worry-free as being a tycoon of global exploitation and um, through slave labor. This is the point where Cassius, he's like, oh, no, I don't want, I don't want this anymore. Mm -hmm. And he automatically, you know, nopes the fuck out. So he leaves in a hurry. He suspects that the, um, that the cocaine that the CEO of Worry Free gave him was actually the drug that mutates you into a half horse. So, you know, Cassius is like, you know, fully mortified um, at this point. So he turns on his um, previous employees. He turns on being a power caller. He turns on the power calling um, center. Um, he starts trying to make exposures. Um, he starts trying to make exposures through social media on the news, which completely backfires, mm -hmm. mind you. Um, this provided ample um, exposure. Just not just exposure, but um, positive exposure for worry free the ceo is really happy about the fact that they could frame this news as being like an advancement in human development and an example of innovation um from there there's a brief struggle um where cassius joins in on the struggle um, between the union organizers and the union busters um, the militarized union busters um, hired by um, regal view and worry free there's a big showdown near the climax and mind you all this happens like the last 15 minutes of the movie yeah yeah so it's not like Cash has had this much time to be a class trader. Um, at this point, there's like a big scuffle between Worry Free and, um, you know, Worry Free's union busters and like the union organizers. His old football team, they come out and they start, um, you know, fighting the union organ. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, um, the, the movie reveals that the horse people that Worry Free was creating were actually sentient. And yeah, they are, were just chill. Yeah, they're know? really chill. Like, they're like one normal of them, dudes, just like as big and strong as horses. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, they, they come through like like superheroes. They, you know, they they beat up the union organize uh, the union busters, not the union organized, the union busters. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a scene where they go, uh, where the character played by uh, Steven Yeun, if anybody knows that actor, um, the principal union organizer, he looks at the horses, the horse people, and they're like, oh. Uh, you know, different struggle, but it's the same fight. And he puts up. Yeah, yeah. He does the fist. He does the fist in the air, right? Um, so then everything's cool. Um, Cassius has decided that being a power caller sucks. Um, being bourgeois sucks. He's for the people now. He goes back with his uncle. Um, throughout the movie, there's like this little picture of um, I don't know what family member it is. I think it's his dad or something. They never clarify what family member it is. It's most likely Cassius's dad. Or, like, you know, some close relative to him. Uh, there's that picture shows up whenever there's a big moment for Cassius, like, throughout his personal development, you know, and the picture changes. So, you know, when he first gets hired at Regal View, like, um, the picture is like a, a thumbs up and like a smile. And there's always like a, a, a like, Gen 1 Ford Mustang that he's like leaning on. Yeah. Um, so he, like, He's got the smile and the thumbs up, and then when Cassius makes a mistake, he's like, you know, he's frowning, uh, looking disappointed at Cassius. So it's it's generally like a representation of like uh, Cassius's moral conscience. Yeah, the um, I would say that throughout the movie, that picture, that picture of his family, of his relative, um, obviously his facial expressions changing, um, you know, as he judges Cassius's actions differently as well as Cash's girlfriend slash ex-girlfriend or mm. whatever, are both um, can be seen as compasses for the movie, as um, ways for the audience to gauge Cash's class commitments and his overall development. Um, so at the end of the movie, you know, the guy in that picture looks super happy because Cash says that he is on the way to quote unquote help change the world. Um, and then he's, at he's jumping up, he's clicking his heels, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a real great time. Yeah, he's happy as fuck, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? He's, you know what I'm saying? I've never seen him that happy. He might be the happiest person in that whole movie. Yeah, yeah, he really might be. He, you you know? know, so, you know, that happens. Um, the union guys win a whole street brawl and nobody's that happy. Yeah, they, they weren't, yeah, yeah. The, the union guys, with the help of, like, football players that Cassius grew up with in mm -hmm. his old neighborhood, 
um, even won a brawl, and nobody was celebrating the way that guy was. So um, they have their big moment at the end where Cassius gets to keep some of his um, the trinkets he got through his class. Um, there's class treacherous actions. He gets to keep a new. T he still lives in the same. He still lives in his uncle's house, but he has a nice new TV. He can pay his rent. You know, he can pay got, his rent now. He's got a nice little TV. He's got like new paint. Um, you know, thing like new bed, things like that. And then at the end, he himself um, is hinted at turning into a horse uh, person. And then in the post credit scene, um, this is when you start to see um, the post credit scene involves um, him and many of the other horse dudes um, going up to the house of the CEO of Worry Free, and presumably killing him they so the movie ends like the post credit scene ends like they break into steve lift's house um and like you can definitely read uh intention to kill uh within that because like you know like kind of a war cry uh is like yelled out as they break down the door uh steve lift looks like terrified uh in the background um, and then they cut the black. So it's, it's very heavily like implied that they kill him, that they just rip his head off. Yeah. Um, so with that, um, with, um, you know, given the overview of the film, um, I guess we begin by talking about, um, the move, like our criticisms for the movie's general, um, polit movie's general, um, political line. Mm-hmm and the lines that the movie espouses. And I think one of the key principle um, criticisms we can give to a movie like this is it's generally pretty vague. It's not clear. A lot of things about the movie are not clear. Um, Cash's development at the end of the film where he talks about changing the world is very unclear. The kind of world, um, the kind of changes necessary to oversee, to supersede the problems that are discussed in the movie, this contradiction between labor and capital, this contradiction between private appropriation and, and collective production. Um, the movie does not provide clear answers of how to supersede the problems presented within it. It shows us that workers are spontaneously rising up to fight back against their bosses, in this case, this singular corporation that can be blamed for every wrong thing that happens in the movie. Um, but that's very, but that's it. That's all the movie really gives us. It, it's a really interesting theoretical error that the movie is making where, you know, the only real organizing that goes on in the movie is kind of towards the very beginning where uh, Steven Yoon's character, I believe his name is Squeeze, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's Squeeze. Yes, yeah, Squeeze. Uh, Squeeze, you know, shows up and, like, taps Cassius on the shoulder. And he's like, hey, man, you know, it's real cool what you said in there. And he's, like, referring to, like, this business meeting where uh, Cassius was like, does that mean we get paid more? When he's, like, told, like, oh, they're a family. Uh, and he, Squeeze is like, it's real cool that you said that, man. You know, some of us are, like, getting together to organize a union. You should meet us at this bar afterwards. And they talk for a bit, you know, uh, about, like, this action that they're planning, uh, like a work stoppage. And, like, that's kind of it that we get for the organizing. Um, there's not much else that goes in there. And so, like, tacitly, the movie is really praising, like, the spontaneity of the workers. You know, the workers will just spontaneously, like, rise up when the conditions get, like, bad enough uh, and, and, and seize power, you know through whatever means they can. Yeah, the, um, the horse people, I imagine, are meant to represent the industrial proletariat. Mm -hmm. And it's not even shown if they're leading the, um, the movement, if they're leading this um, union struggle, and for what purpose. Because, mm -hmm. of course, we definitely believe that the proletariat should lead a movement like this, but the movie does not have the explanatory power to demonstrate why that is. And the horse people don't seem to organize very much at all. They just kind of came through to beat the fuck out of people. Yeah, yeah. They just kind of show up, you know, and kill a dude, um, bust some heads. And That's that, pretty much it. Yeah, I know it was cool, but I mean, the movie like, definitely um, does not portray them as able to theoretically lead a movement or anybody being mm -hmm. able to. The movie 
does not seem to place an emphasis on leadership for a movement like mm-hmm. this. Um, even in this union struggle, um, Squeeze is operating through plain trade union, tra- plain uh, trade union consciousness. Yeah, trade union. He, he's only talking about wanting better pay, wanting to make sure workers don't eat workers eat more than just ramen noodles every night. All very good, very desirable outcomes, but. There's a very big difference between that and what Cassius Hinn said at the end of the movie, changing the world. Because one of these things requires a serious change in productive and social relations. One of these things require genuine revolutionary change. And this is not what Squeeze is getting at. The movie d- seems very vague about these demarcating lines. Yeah. These are not the same thing. Yeah. What Cassius is talking about in the film is not the same thing as what Squeeze is talking about much earlier in the film, what frames so much of the conflict throughout the film. The movie does not clarify this very well. It, it, the, the whole thing sort of reminds me of a, a quote from Lenin, actually, uh, where, uh, if I can remember it correctly, it's in What is to be Done. Um, Lenin says, um, without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement, I believe. Um, and, you know, the movie contains no real revolutionary theory, you know, and because it contains no real revolutionary theory, it's just operating in this, like, trade unionist zone, you know, where it's like the union is the be-all, end-all thing, um, where there is no, like, party, uh, led by the workers to really lead a revolutionary struggle. There is no revolutionary theory to be found. It just leaves it open to like praise the spontaneity of the workers, you know. Mm. Yeah, and um, even at the post-credit scene where all of the horse people go and kill the CEO, you know, the um, I'm sure that's very cathartic, and you know, of course it is. But you know, this is there, there's no indication that there was a plan for any of this, or that this was backed by a wider mass movement. It's just killing a guy. And, and Cassius only took part in this because he got himself got turned into yeah, a horse. Yeah, he got turned if, into if a horse. If this didn't happen, he would have been watching that shit on his new TV <laughs> and been like, oh, damn. You know, like, oh, that's man, crazy. That's crazy, that, that's, dude. That's really crazy. They killed him. No way. <laughs> yeah, he would have been watching. Yeah, he would have been watching that show. He only, and, and that's another thing about the movie. Cassius's development is, in, is totally unearned. He did not care about any of this up until there was a risk that he himself got turned into a horse person. It didn't it wasn't about him realizing that he was contributing to war crimes. Dog, he's so willing to ship out these five hundred pound JP bombs to <laughs> whoever. To whoever. To who to whoever. But he draws the line at being turned into a horse. And not like really at seeing other people become a horse he draws the line of being turned into a horse himself. yeah when he first saw the horse because you see in the movie he learns about the horse thing it's not like he learned about it watching you know like l- listening to the ceo he learned about it because the guy told him go through what was it the emerald door no the jade door. the jade door they're all green they're all green doors to go to the bathroom because mm-hmm. he just had to go pee yeah, yeah he wanted and, to go pee and he went in a door that's a slightly different shade of green and then he finds like the horse people experiments and at that point, when he runs back, he's freaking out and he wants to leave. But I mean, he's just scared. He did not. He was not really down until he himself was at risk of turning into a horse. Mm-hmm. So his whole development is completely unearned. Like this only happened because he just. I mean, you know, reasonable, you know, but he just did not want to be turned into like that's all this was about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a shame that at the end of the movie. And mind you, all this happens very close to the end of the movie. It's a shame all this happens at the expense of the mountain class struggle that's happening. Like this big uh, confrontation between union organizers and union busters. To where the union organizers won. That gets like no real attention. No, not really. That, there's no discussion about the ripple effects this, have, this has throughout um, their like, struggle. Exactly, the larger working class movement. The larger know? working class movement. Like this isn't really discussed. The movie ends on what is like an impri- implied uprising of sorts, you know? And they discuss none of that. It, like, they talk, talk a lot about changing the world, uh, about like, you know, this big worker uprising, uh, like really 
cueing in to the viewer like that this is, you know, the moment when the, the worker sees the means of production, you know. But it doesn't get into that at all. It instead prioritizes like Cassius's personal development over this much larger, much more primary thing. So it leaves you really wanting like to see like what's going on over here, what's going on over here, and then they just don't show it. Yeah, it um it treats Cassius's development as um primary at the expense of the wider collective developments that happened over the course of the movie. And so because of that, because Cash's development is so tied to those things, um, it blunts both. And so the movie leaves you wondering how Cash has such unearned development and unearned praise for decisions he made at like the last 15 minutes of the movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that's gen like generally more of like a consequence of the pacing of the movie itself. Like yeah. towards the end of the movie, it's very, it's very rushed. And that's like my one critique of like, the um, technical aspect of the film is just sort of like the rushed, you know, le uh, later portions of the film. Um, and like, I feel like if they would have added like an extra 20 minutes to the movie, like we could have gotten a lot more context for what was going on in like, um, you know, uh, in, in the greater workers movement, but they really don't show that, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and, and, and even questions or even the goal, the aim of um, workers seizing the means of production, the workers having ownership over the means of production, all of which involves in this, all of which, you know, has a prerequisite of very structural change to productive and social relations in society, a fundamental change in society. This isn't never really said outright. Like Cash's girlfriend gives a couple lines in the movie about capitalism. She's probably, I think, the only character who directly talks about, who explicitly uses the word capitalism throughout yeah. the movie. Um, but other than that, I mean, the idea of seizing the means of production, of having like this serious socialist transition within society, is never really brought up or really made clear by any of like the main characters. Like none of the, none of the class struggle that happens towards the end of the movie is said to be in service or said to be the preliminary to that kind of movement growing out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be, um, I think, a very serious weakness of the film. Um, the, lack of, the lack of emphasis on leadership, the confused understanding of state machinery um, and its role it plays in, revolution in like revolutionary process and development. Um, I think all of our rather severe flaws for a movie like this to have, but for what it is at the same time, you know, this isn't, you know, we, I think it's good to sing the movie's praises too. The yeah, movie, we've, been, we've been slamming on the movie for a little bit, um, but like, I, I do want to clarify that like, it is a really good movie. You know, it's extremely progressive for what it is. I um, think um, one of my favorite things about the movie is that it's able to, because the movie does does have like very interesting things to say about um, the conditions of the working class. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I find that interesting. The movie's able to touch on superstructural issues like white supremacy and racism without making that the core of its analysis or making that the core of the line espoused in the movie. I, I think it actually does a really good job of tying those issues like back into the economic base, you know? Where it's like we look at the white voice, for example, uh, where it like it doesn't like do the the thing of like seeing you know identity as the be all end all thing. It, it does a great job of connecting it to the class position, you know, uh, like in the economic base. Where it's like you know the white voice is not like a white voice in and of itself. The white voice is a, a class voice. It's a bourgeois voice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a capitalist voice. Uh, I, I, in America, that is a white voice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, like, the movie does a, a real fantastic job of, like, tying these issues together. But it just, like, doesn't go far enough, you know? Yeah, and as Cassius changes his, um, his class position, he starts to lose his ability to interact authentically and openly with his friends. Um, there's a part in the movie where he's having an argument with one of his old friends that he grew up with. Um, and in that argument, he starts telling him, 
hey, I hope that you find success, brother. I hope, yeah. you know what I mean? I and hope your week is filled with beautiful days. You know, you smell good. You smell, yeah. what, what scent is that, you know? They immediately stop being able to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, Cassius's class character, his, um, his class position, his um, class interests begin to conflict with his ability to have authentic, meaningful relationships. Mm-hmm. At this point, he becomes an island just to himself, um, alienated from his girlfriend, his uncle, his family, and his friends. And he's left with a room of bourgeois pencil pushers that... The, the, on, the only meaning in Cassius's life at that point is, like, generating value. It's, like, generating, you know, surplus value. is like, doing good at his job. Which and, he, and he takes great pride in this. Whenever Cassius is made to defend his actions, being, you know, helping enable war crimes without the movie, whenever someone questions this, he usually will say that, you know, he does it because he's good at it. Mm-hmm. It's, so. it's the Breaking Bad excuse. You know, I, I liked it. Yeah. I was good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, the way the movie discusses Cassius' position Movie's able to recognize that, you know, Cash is not just a regular power caller, but he's one that's exotic. He's he, one that's... He's goaded. Yeah, he's goated. He's, he's exotic and he's different and interesting to a predominantly white bourgeois audience um, that he surrounds himself with when he goes to their parties. And so the movie definitely um, discusses how Cash is viewed in these kind of spaces, how he becomes a caricature of rap music and interesting stories. And the only other person in that room who could understand this like super structural issue, or rather has been on the receiving end of it, who's long since abandoned his identity, because he himself does not ever turn against Worry Free or Regal View or any of that. Not only that, but his identity being abandoned is such a textual point in the movie where they every time his name is mentioned, it's censored. There's a, uh, I, I think they go as far as like showing a black bar over the mouths of the characters mm-hmm. and like l- literally, you know, bleeping it out. Uh, it, 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 like you can't hear it. That's how much his ident- identity has been eroded in the film and just been like completely absorbed into the bourgeoisie where it's just like he, it, he doesn't have an identity. He is a lackey of the bourgeoisie and that's it. Yeah, and in particularly sad one too. Yeah, in yeah. That at the end where you know Travis gay, uh, Cash, Travis, when Cassius um, finished giving his like, his um, you know his cipher, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, in front of like you know his, his white cipher, bu- yeah, in front of his his bourgeois audience, you know the guy comes around and he's like, hey, he, this is the f- first time he doesn't use his white voice. Mm-hmm. He you know he completely abandons it and he tells him like, hey. Um, you know that it is what it is and that you know that that part of the movie i think really resonated um that really stuck with me in particular that he has to pick up he has to lick his wounds and tell himself that it is a-okay because it's for the sake of my class position that's a a rather sad way to Mm -hmm. live um but even still cassius only ever does anything against this when he gets turned into a horse yeah even this happening, Cassius was like, oh, you know, once I get, you know, once I get a billion, you know, b- um, through, you know, through these war crimes, I'll be good. Mm-hmm. So even with that, you know, Cassius still does not yet become a class traitor he, up until, you know, his humanity, his literal humanity is at stake. I mean, not even his literal humanity. His literal humanity is gone at this point, you know, like he's willing to completely give up his identity. He's willing to do all of this. Uh up until his body is compromised. Once his body becomes compromised, that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, he's given everything else to the bourgeoisie. He's sacrificed his friends, he's sacrificed his identity, you know, his ability to communicate, all of this. He's he's sacrificed it for, you know, uh, profit and for feeling good. Um, And it only comes down to the point where it's like, oh wow, they're doing genetic mutation, you know? That's that's when it's too far. I think something about the movie um, that I find interesting is that the way it's framed here, that Cash discovers a dirty secret about worry-free, um, is what pushes him over the edge. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, in Cash is trying to combat Worry Free, he's trying to make big exposures. He's using um, secret footage of um, horse people being locked in cells with the CEO speaking to them as evidence that he's showing the entire world um, that Worry Free is a criminal um, company. Mm -hmm. And I think um, something that can be read um, read into this is that it comes off as incredibly conspiratorial. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, it's, it's as if Worry Free was just a company, just like any other, up until the, the horse people thing. Even though the movie makes it very clear that what they do is essentially slave labor. No, the, not essentially. It is. Yeah. It is, it is objectively slave labor. You know, there's a, a point where Cassius's girlfriend and Cassius get into an argument um, about like him being a power caller um, for uh, Worry Free. And she like tells him to his face, like, you sell slave labor. This shit is morally emaciating. You know, and he's still like cool with it, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is just so strange because, it, like, he he refuses to draw that line for himself. You know, he refuses to 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 really see how this like his role in in the larger dynamics of things, which I think gets to the point of like you know the petty bourgeois like the petty bourgeoisie sort of refusing to see their larger role in the scape in the scope of capitalist development. Um, but like, it, it's just impressive how how far you know he has to go, uh, in order to like really come to the clu- conclusion of like, oh no, it all has to come down. Yeah, and um, it's the way the movie. I also think it frames this revelation, because it was at this point where it was evident that Worry Free was an evil corporation for them to fight against. You know, it's as if the um, the very base mechanics of capitalist exploitation and surplus value extraction wasn't the problem up until it was this. Mm-hmm. Like this ultimately, you know, the, you know, transforming um, people to become literal workhorses for the sake of productivity is a secondary feature of the primary issue here, yeah. which is capitalist appropriation. Mm-hmm. And yet this is not framed as primary in the, the movie's final conclusion. No, the thing that's framed as primary in the movie's conclusion is the horse people, you know? Yeah. It, it, the movie takes, like, a really good visual premise of, like, you know, uh, the industrial proletariat being, like, literal workhorses. Um, and, like, sort of strips that of... <clears throat> most of its, like, real character, shows the horse people, kind of gets obsessed with this image of the horse people, and then just, like, treats that as the the primary contradiction of the film. Uh, When it's really not, it's just capitalist appropriation. Mm -hmm. And because all the characters, because this is a source of unity for the union organizers and the industrial proletariat as the horse people in the film, now suddenly they're all banding together out of conspiracy, mm-hmm. out of an awareness of conspiracy and not just awareness of class consciousness. There is not a single character in the movie that draws a conclusion that maybe this is due to our, our, economic, our economic system. You know, it's, it is solely a question of, oh, it's a different struggle, but it's the same fight. Mm-hmm. And I suppose the audience is left to figure out exactly what that means. Yeah, yeah. But for what it is, I mean, the movie celebrating union struggle, the movie celebrating working class struggle. No, yeah, general. yeah, it definitely is. It, it, it is celebrating the struggle of the workers. It does a good job of celebrating the struggle of the workers. You know, it is very firmly on the side of the workers for the entire runtime of the film. It, it, it doesn't slip up and treat Cassius's actions as like morally good. Um, it, it shows that like Cassius is kind of acting like a fool for most of the runtime of the movie. I think that's like fairly textual. The movie um, is very critical of Cassius. Mm-hmm. It, uh, extremely critical of, of Cassius, you know, very frequently the man in the pictures, you know, thumb, thumbs down, not approving of Cassius's actions. Um, I think, um, the reason why the CEO likes Cassius as much as he does, I think he said, is because Cassius is someone who is clearly capable of stabbing his friend in the back to get what he wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he is, you know, throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. He, so. he does over and over again throughout the movie. And he, it's not even something that he lets, him, lets himself be fully aware of up until, like, the point of no return with the horse people. 
uh, it, it's like, oh, you know, I'm just looking out for me. You know, I'm, I'm rooting for you guys, but I'll root from the sidelines, you know? And it treats that as like a complete and total betrayal, uh, which I think is like a very solid, positive element of the movie. Of like, you know, you, you, this is taking a side. You can't not take a side here. Yeah, the movie is very unambiguous mm-hmm. in how it treats... If there's anything about the movie that is unambiguous, it's how it treats Cassius. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, we can use Cassius' girlfriend throughout the film, and we can use um, the picture of Cassius' relative as a compass for us to be able to judge his actions, given the you know very proletarian um, lens of the movie. It can be a critique that Cassius obviously is not a character that the audience is supposed to look up to, and is not the character that's supposed to be guiding the audience to what conclusions they ought to draw outright in a positive sense. But the movie really lacks a character that's able to do that because none of the characters are, you know, espousing anything that's like theoretically concrete. Yeah, there, there, it's not like there's, you know, say like a, a, any form of like a communist party or anything. Uh, the, it's like... There, there's nothing to really show leadership yeah, it's, you know, you're with it or you're not with it. Mm-hmm. That is the way the movie frames um, left and right deviations. Yeah. So people who are with it, people who are not with it. Mm-hmm. And with it can just mean you're down for good stuff for the workers. Mm-hmm. And that's good. And, and mind, not but. with it is down for bad stuff for the workers, you know? Yeah. Like, you're, you're down with the bourgeoisie and that's bad. Um, and, like, that's how it like completely frames all of these dynamics you know mm-hmm. it, it doesn't dive beyond like any sort of surface level reading uh of like how society functions and at some points like kind of deviates from how society functions where it doesn't really get too involved in like the state's function and upholding capitalism uh in you know upholding class society like not at all you know uh it, it there's there's just not too much that like it goes into detail on. And I think that's a consequence of like the runtime of the film being a little bit too short for what it wanted to talk about. Uh and also just like the lack of theoretical development. Yeah, um I suppose it's very difficult for a movie, especially in for what is usually at most like a two hour runtime, to be able to go that deeply about like these um, rather complicated ideas and concepts. Like, it, you know, the movie could not function as a primer for political economy, for no, example. No, no, no. But at the same time, these are very real questions that the movie doesn't answer. At, also at the same time though, despite everything, it is still a good movie. It is still a movie firmly on the side of the working people. Yeah, yeah. And it is a movie that still has, like, those um, moments of brilliance of cl- in class analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, Cassius's internal struggle is a reflection of very real um, class contradictions that exist within society. And it's demonstrated with a lot of, um, despite the movie's absurdist elements, with a decent degree of realism. I, I, I honestly think, like, the movie's absurdist elements and magical elements do a good job of portraying like real struggles, you know? I, I think it's part of like the cool thing about a movie is like you have all of this creative freedom to express things, uh, like not exactly how they appear, but to show more of it, it's the realism through, you know, something sort of like surreal and absurd, right? Like the horse people, I think is a great visual metaphor for the industrial proletariat, you know, despite the fact that horse people aren't real, Right? It doesn't mean that, like, this is a movie, you know? We can use a visual metaphor to get, like, deeper into something. Uh, and, like, I, I really like that about the movie and how, like, clear it shows this stuff. Uh, I think with some more theoretical development, it would have been really interesting to see, like, the horse people leading a worker struggle, you know? The horse people talking about, like, yeah, you know, we're, we're building a, a party to, like, lead the worker struggle, you know? Something like that, where it's like, no, like, it's time. Like, the working class needs its party, you know? Yeah, the, um... Yeah, because in the movie, the horse people don't really plan or talk at all. The only lines that they have is either to express suffering for their conditions mm-hmm. or just to indicate that they're, like, conscious. Yeah, yeah, like, aware. I'm also still, like, a person, despite my horse appearance. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, um, the movie, 
has a lot of like very good quality it does have like it does portray these things with realism despite its absurdist elements you know we can look at the um certain things within the movie of course it's you know the material conditions and it's like logic for the world that exists within it within its own narrative is something obviously divorced from reality but the core themes and the use of like these tools and these visual aids and these um and these um symbols um to reflect very real things that exist in the real world um you know i think the movie does a great job in how it uses its like magical realism yeah, to exactly. discuss these things mm-hmm. Um, and the movie's like very, very. Um, the movie's like has a lot of energy. Obviously, the actors it has a great energy. You that, know? Yeah, the actors in the film clearly put a lot into their roles. Um, the movie's like pacing. Um, the movie's cinematography is like very poppy and energetic. Mm-hmm. So it's certainly not a boring film. No, no, means. not at all. It's like I. I wouldn't necessarily call it like an edge edge of your seat kind of film, but it, it's a very fun. Uh, an exciting watch so and it does have you know once again like very interesting comments and even moments of brilliance Mm -hmm. um regarding its analysis yeah yeah um i I think just the dynamics between like the proletariat the uh petty bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie uh is you know one of the most brilliant uh expressions that the the movie paints uh where it like really shows that like you know process of losing yourself uh, for like wealth acquis- acquisition, you know, um, I think that's a, like a really strong note of the movie. Mm-hmm. And in you know, a movie, clearly taking a side on this, yes, yeah, is like one of its you know one of its greatest strengths. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the flaws of the movie probably reflect um, Boots Riley's own um, political development mm-hmm. and own level of theoretical understanding, the lack of emphasis on leadership the lack of um, understanding of like these demarcating um, theoretical lines that can exist within a workers' movement and the movie failing to touch upon this. Um, the movie placing um, Cash's development as primary as a consequence of its vague understanding of these processes and demarcating lines within a movement um, kind of makes it to where Cash's de- personal development is placed over the um, very real class struggle happening in the background of the film. Um, I think all these things are consequences of um, perhaps misunderstandings and confusions on on Boots Riley's parts. But with all that being said, the movie um, is still incredibly well made, still um, still has a lot of valuable things to say. Um, I st- definitely think our viewers should go watch it. Oh, yeah, yeah, And yeah. Um, Boots Riley is still, um, you know, very incredible for um, using his position to screenwrite a movie like this. Yeah. And putting it out for the working masses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so shout out to him. Shout out to all his big work. Shout out, big shout out Boots Riley. Big shout out to all his work. Big shout out to his actions in the uh, labor struggle from last year uh, with the, the Screenwriters and Screen Actors Guild. Um, he put forward like a, a, a pretty solid uh, speech uh, and poem um, in that speech, uh, talking about like you know uh, workers owning like the means of production, you know like a socialist transition, to like a lot of general applause from the audience, which was very like fascinating to see, you know just how with it everybody was. Mm-hmm. Um, once again, you know still not really going all the way with like a lot of the theoretical notes but like a lot of it's there you know which is very very cool and exciting to see yeah so um you know once again shout out boots riley mm-hmm. um it was a, you know what a great film yeah, yeah yeah we're you know in a sea of um bourgeois movies that we're subjected to every year it was nice that we have something that um the workers can say reflects their own mm-hmm um so shout out to all the actors that took part in that movie as well Mm -hmm. um and yeah uh yeah so that's been that's been our segment um we hope you guys like really enjoyed uh our segment uh about boots riley sorry to bother you um we are art for the people check us out on instagram at art for the people dot um you know if you're interested uh in our like content that we put out or maybe like 
showing up for an art show. We're definitely going to be having one soon in October. So, you know, hope to see you there. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you for so much for sticking with us. Check out the movie. Um, it's a good movie. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.